Yeah, this has nothing to do with today's lesson. I just thought you'd want to see it. They're putting in a subway right outside the studio here. Huge amount of noise for the last three years, two more years to go. But this is what a subway dig looks like. Out on that street that you see on the background, they brought through the digger like this huge boring machine, six, seven stories tall, and this particular building was actually vibrating as it went by. Uh, but anyway, that's not anything about, I just thought you'd want to see it. That has nothing to do with today's actual lesson. The lesson today is about research. And for those of you who have never done research, just want to know about it. And for those of you who have done research, we are going to talk to an expert. <laughs> Hey Buckaroos, here we go, another one, Music Com Academy, how to be a PD. Awesome, today we are going to talk about research, and we have on with us Jeff Vidler from Signal Hill Insights, a lot of insights into research, and Jeff is with us, as you can see on the screen right now, and Jeff has, uh, um, you know, as far, you've been doing research straight ahead for 28 years, I was figuring out, but you did it before being a PD too, right? And you do it a couple of years. Yeah, ago. I mean, I, my, I started actually um, as a copywriter, but then, you know, um, uh, became a station manager, putting a station on the air in Squamish, BC, a little station in Squamish, BC. Really? Um, and had to make a decision as to whether I was going to, I could have stayed there. It was a mom and pop operation, could have probably owned the station in 10 years because they were going to retire and I could have, you know, stayed there with sweat equity, but I was still like, I was 25 years old and I wasn't ready to sort of pack it up then. So I ended up, um, landed in Toronto as sort of a junior consultant with joint, joint communications where I worked for about, uh, six years. And that's when I first got into research, um, and then went to Montreal, uh, had to prove to the industry I could practice as well as preach and, um, okay. program there for six years. Um, uh, for uh, Mix 96, Hot AC Station, and uh, for CJD, a brief period of time, just kind of caretaking that one. That was a bunch of old pros who knew what they were doing. Yeah. Um, well, you know it well because you followed me as PD. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so, when you went into research full-time. And, and that's when I went into research full-time. Well, you know, I was going to ask you this at the end, but uh, since you already kind of sort of opened the door for this, uh, let, you know, let's take a shot right now. You come out of research and you are now a PD uh, in Montreal, big city, you know, out of the gate. Do you remember anything that ran through your head? Um, you know, because right now, like this particular lesson, what we're doing, actually the whole, all the lessons, you know, I'm trying to do them for people who have just become a PD. They don't really know what too much. They don't, you know, I want to fill in the blanks for them so that they don't have to, you know, be in terror most of the time, but never ever show it. So that's kind of the, <laughs> the brunt of the course. But also, um, a, you know, pretty decent chunk of it, which we'll get into here is veering off for somebody who has, who, who is a PD now and has been a PD for, for a long while and maybe uh, is doing research or you know, their company has never done research because they don't want to, you know, spend the money or they don't have the money or whatever. So I'm trying to bounce back and forth between experience and inexperience. You know, you go to Montreal, did anything immediately sort of come to mind like, oh, man, you know, like, what do I do here? Or I wish I knew this. I wish somebody told me this. Well, for me, the challenge was I had done a little bit of on-air work, but very little bit in Squamish when that station put that station on the air for about six months and that was it. So the terrifying part for me was walking in and, and managing talent and, and understanding right. what it was like for them uh, behind the microphone, uh, how that was to do that every day, day in, day out in, in a much more high pressure situation than doing a couple hours in mid days in Squamish, BC. Um, and, and, you know, that was part of the thing. And the other thing was because I'd been a consultant, I'd been doing research, I kind of came in and thought I had all the answers. Oh, interesting. You know, that, you know and, and, and it really learned through that time that, you know, programming is about leadership. Um, not about having the right answers. It's about leadership. It's about, um, well, you know this, Pat. I mean, you're so good at this, inspiring uh, the team with your vision and also supporting them in everything they do. Right. Um, yeah. and, and so they want to come to work every day. They look forward to it. They want to do it for you. They want to do it for the listeners. They want to do it for the team. Um, and, and that for me was the part that was harder for me to learn because I just hadn't been a jock to start with. And, um, you know, I was, you know, kind of, uh, you know, I've been doing uh, consulting and research a little too long at that early stage to, to sort of open up and say, geez, I don't have all the answers um, yeah. and I need to understand what's going on. 
Interesting. You know, it's funny when I, when I first got to CKLW, um, and I, I realized this uh, just a few years later um, down the road. When I first got there, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a new kid. I'm, I'm young. Uh, you know, I'm 22 years old, and I'm at this monster radio station. And I just assumed that everything that they told me was gospel. So, <laughs> point being, I bought into the vision, whatever they told me. You know, I was in 100 percent and so was everybody else, which made it incredibly uh, easy and important for the PD there to move the station any direction that he wanted it to go, because everybody just immediately, you know, there was no questioning. There was no, oh, I don't know. You know, it was just like, ooh, OK, yeah, let's do that. And, you know, and it, it was an interesting thing to to, to sort of realize, you know, a few years later, so that, as you're saying, when I became a PD, um, you know, that's one of those things that you'd want people to do. It's like, this is where we're going. You know, everybody understands it, everybody on board, everybody good with it. You, you, know, you, un, you, you know, you explain all the whys and all that crap. And then, yeah, okay, let's hit it and go. And everybody's on the same page. Getting people on the same page and same vision, whew, that is hugely important. Really glad yeah. you, you, you brought that up. Yeah, it's yeah. neat. I mean, it takes a lot of empathy. You know, you have to understand. You have to walk a mile in their moccasins, right, to understand where they're coming from and and what you need to do to motivate them, right? Yeah, yeah, and you know, it certainly helps. Um, you know, if you've been on the air, you know, to, at least to some degree, that you get an idea of what it's like. Because that's it looks easy, but that's not an easy gig. You know, to be on the air. You know, it's a pretty pressure filled thing. You know, to go into a room all by yourself, you're talking to this metal thing in front of you and you're, hey, be happy, be, be, be interesting, be sharp, be this, be that. You know, when you're in a dark room all by yourself all day long, it's kind of weird, really. But uh, you know, anyway, so let, let's uh, let, let's do some easy research. OK, um, in the beginning, um, as far as I can remember, the first radio research was call out. And then that sort of turned into AMT's auditorium music testing, AMT being the short version of that. Mm -hmm. Explain to people who don't know what that is, you know, what they are, you know, sure. you don't, how do they work and that type of thing. Yeah, sure. I mean, actually, the first kind of research for music on radio stations was um, having the music director call up the record stores and see what songs were selling, right? Yes, yes, um, yes. And you would tally right, yeah, up, you know, all uh, the sales and give different points to different record stores, depending on how many units they sold. Um, and that would be how you determine whether a song was a hit or not and whether it was fading or not. The problem with that was the, that tells you what the people who are really active musically and are out buying records think. But it doesn't necessarily tell you about the people who listen to your radio station who who may like music, but they aren't going out there and they're not buying the latest record every day. Um, you know, they take a little bit longer to warm up to some of those records that come out. Um, and they, you know, don't necessarily have the same tastes as people who are musically active. So I think it would be 50 years ago now, uh, stations started doing call out. They would call up people um, who are listeners to their station and or their competitors um, and they would play clips of songs you know um, you know 30 40 clips of songs and ask people how they felt about those songs and the results that came back from that were different than what you got from the record stores it did take that more passive audience a little longer to catch up to some of those songs um, and it was a very powerful tool back in the 70s and a lot of stations uh, top 40 you know it was you know so many top 40 stations back then and it was such an important part of um a top 40 station was being on top of the latest current hits and 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 but playing them at the right time for the audience and those stations that use that were very successful with it so you know that really sort of established the whole idea of testing music among um, a passive audience as being an important part of of you know playing the right music for your radio station. How long would you say roughly, and, and, and I guess the big one is, has it changed? Has it got faster or slowed down when, you know, as best you can, you know, you could, you would know, a song comes out, they start to test it. Um, you know, the, the familiarity is low, probably the scores are low right or along the same time. And then finally it kind of moves up where it's like, okay, that's a pretty strong testing song. How many weeks do you think that usually takes? Probably six weeks on average, but it really depends on how many spins it's getting on your station and on the other stations in the market because it needs that familiarity to really take off, right? I mean, there are some songs that will hit immediately, um, but most songs that are radio songs will take 
sometime before they have enough familiarity that people, you know, first step with music is familiar. I'm familiar with it. Second step is, Oh, I like that. Um, and, and getting to that point, um, you know, you're, you're usually, I, I don't think okay, you ever normally see a song test well being familiar and testing well, unless it's had, you know, 200 spins on your station. Um, if it's mostly your, um, if you're, you know, your, your P one or your favorite station listeners. And, and for those who are not familiar, a P1 would be a heavy listener. That's yeah. That's what he listens a lot. Yeah. Because again, you know, newbies. <laughs> for, first preference, right? Yeah. Preference yeah. one. That that this is the station that you listen to most often when it's your choice. Um, on an auditorium test, if you get up to 500 songs, I mean, it, it, would, would you go to 500 now or is it lower, 400, 300, 350? Where do people you know, tire of it, like uh... the auditorium music tests or, you know, the library tests, which is sort of what I call them now, because they're not always done in audit. Well, they're actually rarely done in auditoriums now. They're mostly done right. online. Yeah. Um, but it's really, you know, they're for stations that are gold based stations. So if you're, you know, if you're a classic hit station, even if you're an AC station and you've got a large gold library, then you want to be able to test your gold on a regular basis, ideally at least once a year um, so that you're kind of on top of, you know, because there are trends in gold music as well the song that was a hit in 1984 doesn't stay a hit forever right um some do but um you know every breath you take police i think is one that you know this, this stays you know a hit forever but most of them uh, rise and fall with the tide um and the tide of times and sometimes a movie will bring a song back and all of that stuff but and also the airplay the station's playing those songs in power some of them will hold on but some of them may burn out and the appeal mm -hmm. drops on them as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, but to do that, you can't just play 40 songs over the telephone and you can't have someone on the telephone for to play them clips of 500 songs either. So that's where the idea of auditory music test came on. That's sort of like early 80s. Uh, when stations started to do that. And yeah, it was typical, sort of 500, 600 songs, because that would be an evening. You could, um, you know, hour and a half, two hours of listening to clips of songs. You'd break it up maybe with a little dinner in between or a break in the middle so they go out and have a smoke or whatever that was. The cost of that is high. What would be the cost of doing it the old way and then doing it online? Good question. So, I mean, it, again, it depends on how tight the screening specs are. If you're trying to find needles in a haystack, then the recruiting costs will go up. And depending on the market you're in, you may have to pay higher incentives to get people to travel to where you're going for the music test. But I mean, you know, typically you should be able to do an auditory music test for somewhere in the range of twenty to thirty thousand dollars these days. You used to be able to do them for ten to fifteen thousand dollars, but that you know that that goes back to the eighties when, when these things first got started. Right? Is that amount um, the old way or the or the online way? It's so the that way that yeah, that's the auditory music test would be that. Now, online is less expensive. Number one, you don't have to find uh, you know a hotel to do it right. in. You don't have to you know pay a caterer to food, feed people. Um, the incentives typically aren't as high either. Um, and there's various different ways of doing online testing. It's depending on, on the size of a station's gold library. I mean, classic hit stations are sometimes running active libraries of 500 and 600 songs. So to test five or 600 songs isn't good enough. That just tells you about all the songs you're playing. It doesn't tell you which ones you're going to drop because they mm -hmm. don't test well. So, you know, for those stations, we might test 900 songs, 1,000 songs at a time. Wow. But each individual listener doing it online can, first of all, start and stop it as they choose, um, but they don't necessarily do the entire test. Um, they're played, the songs are all randomized. So they get, they'll, they'll test maybe 300 songs or 400 songs from that list. And you'll just have a larger sample of people and they will all in a sense be listening a little bit to different songs, but, oh, um, it, cool. it gives you a larger sample to work with in a sense, but it gives you the opportunity to, to test even more songs. So, you know, when you're looking at something like that, I mean, you've got to pay for, you got to access panel. You can use your own database for those people as well. And that, you know, is great, but it only tells you about your own fans. Mm -hmm. um, and again, they may not represent the market in general, especially if you're a station that is trying to acquire audience, um, not just protect the audience you have. You want to know where can I get some new listeners from? You want to understand the music tastes of your competitors as well. So you need to get not just your P1 or your first preference listeners, but you need to get people who maybe cum the station from time to time, or maybe just like the music mix that you play, but really don't know much about the station. You want to know what their tastes are so you can bring, you can widen your cum and bring in a bigger audience. And for that, really, you have to find some kind of external panel that you can go to um, where people are paid incentives um, to do the research, um, 
Um, but again, that incentive typically isn't as high as it would be to get somebody to go halfway across town and spend an evening. Um, you're telling them this is something they can do at home. The advantage too is that you you don't have to worry about, you know, if you're in Los Angeles, you don't have to worry about is everybody from Burbank and and <laughs> right. and, and Long Beach going to come to my facility where I'm holding this music Likely test? Not. No, <laughs> online you can you you've got the geographies looked after, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, I, and and the costs are less. I mean, you're looking at typically. I mean, it really depends again on on the size of the sample and all that. But you ten fifteen thousand dollars, you can do an online music test. That's a, that's a yeah. sizable drop. Let's yeah. be a PD for a second um, w with that, and then we'll move on to to you know some other things. Um, you get the uh, you get the music test back. There's let's just say there's 500 songs. The high score, if you're doing it at a one to a hundred scale, if it works out to that, the high score is 93 as an overall total, and for that's the best you know group of songs. Maybe there's three or four of those, and you know, and then the scores start dropping, and the lowest one is 30. How do you know where to make the cut cutoff? Do you just go in the middle in between? You know, let's just say 90 and 30. You know, like 60 the cutoff. You know, or you know, like what would you do? You know, when you look at it, you, you know, how would you how would you attack looking at those numbers? Not not knowing what the songs are, but just the numbers as I'm describing them. The tool that's used widely, software that's available and, and that we use, and I think most of the other research firms use as well is um, analyst software um, which um, looks at your music test scores and allow and it automatically does things like calculate standard deviation if you go back to your grade 11 science you might remember things about bell curves because what happens with music tests is that you get what's called a very normal distribution in terms of the way the songs fall out you've got you know there's there's kind of this you know spike in the middle um, where you know a lot of the songs kind of test somewhere in the middle, but then there are songs that test really well, and there are songs that test much worse than that. So you've got that kind of bell curve where most of the songs are kind of in that middle zone, but then one standard deviation away from that, above that, um, are you know a handful of songs, and it might be as much as fifteen to twenty percent of the of, of the sample of the songs that you've tested are testing really at what you might say is like a power level, because mm -hmm. you know once you're more than one standard deviation away from the other scores you can feel some pretty confident those songs definitely test better than the stuff that's in the middle. Um, and at the other side of that, you've got those songs that test one center deviation below that or lower. Well, those are songs you can feel pretty comfortable are songs that test worse than the rest of the stuff that you're testing. So that makes it an easy kind of convenient cutoff point of songs you might drop and songs that you might put into like a power rotation on the other mm -hmm. side, the ones that are stand, one standard deviation or above. Um, and, and then the songs in the middle, I mean, there's obviously difference in the scores there, and you want to look at those differences, but you also want to look at those differences not just among the overall sample, but you look at them among your P1 audience, you look at it among those CUM listeners who aren't your P1 audience, you look at it in terms of if it's a you know, station that you're trying to balance men and women, you know, look at it among men, look at it among women, look at it among younger end of your demo, older end of your demo, and kind of see, you know, are those, those songs that really do well across the board are the ones you feel most comfortable with. Um, sometimes there'll be songs in the middle, but they don't test very well with maybe your P1s, or they don't test very well with people who aren't your P1s, and you may be, okay, I'm not going to play that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I, so you can, you, with analyst software, you can actually set filters so that you can actually set that standard deviation for all the different subgroups as well. So you can say, okay, I want to have uh, songs that test at least above that cutoff point for not only the overall sample, but for men, for women, for younger, for older, for my P1s, for my Q listeners as well. From a programming part, um, you know, to, 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 to try to marry the two. Um, you know, for the P1s or for it, make it an easy one for, say, you got an AC station and you have some song where the overall score is, you know, is, is somewhat weak, but their women's score is awesome. You know, what you might get that it's got like an, I don't know, 85, 86 for women, but not so good for men. You might want to just day part that into midday just for women, assuming you have a lot of women in midday and, uh, you know, and roll, roll the song there and not play it in in the drives where more men are, uh, you know, you can make those types of decisions where, you know, day parting comes in or even packet it with two or three of those songs. So they don't, because they're ultimately overall, they're weaker and you don't want them coming around as fast as a normal gold song. So you could slow them down, you know, and be super detailed as to where, where they play. I mean, that's one of the great things about you know music scheduling software. Yeah, I mean you could even hand bomb them and put them into places when you're doing the scheduling. Where got I got a run of male appeal songs here. I need to have something in there that's going to hold women, right? Yeah. To use your example would be one way to do it. Or 
day parts too. Another thing you look at, and, and you know, as well as the appeal of the song, you want to know the familiarity of the song as well. Particularly for an adult contemporary station or classic hit station, familiarity is half the battle, at least half the battle. Um, mm -hmm. That people know the songs that they can hum along to them or sing along to them. But there may be songs that test really well, have lower familiarity, and you'll play them, but you're not going to play them in the morning show. Yeah, you where you want to make sure you, it, all those songs are standing on their own. There's talk on both sides. You want to make sure everybody knows that song. There's overall songs that are just fine. And then there's other ones you would deal with in some way, but you kind of want to know that you have dynamite in your hand. <laughs> you know, right, as you're right. doing it, you, know, you got to be a little bit more careful with those, uh, those type of things. Um, so let's <laughs> like say there's that. a new, uh, let's change the switch gears here. Let's just say there's a, you, you, you're putting, you're changing format or there's a new station in town or you're a new PD and come in and station you're at is horrible and you want to you know you want to move into the market with some other new format and you would do a perceptual i mean maybe yeah. even for a station that's actually going along i would think you'd use perceptual for you know an annual gut check as to whether you're moving off course or not yeah yes. it's like a brand checking your brand health really right that you, you go oh, in once yeah, a year yeah. and make sure that you're still owning the images in the market that you want to own and that your talent is performing well and all of that. Um, you were talking about, though, if you're looking for a new format, that's kind of a special kind of perceptual study where there okay. you're kind of going in to try to understand where is there a format hole in the market. Um, um, and you may ask a lot of the same questions you would in that brand health study and understand, you know, who's strong, who's weak on various images where there may be opportunities. But there also you're going to probably want to test some different formats um, that and, and understand what the appeal is and understand if anybody is currently associated with them to see if if I got a, something here that people love but they don't hear or don't associate with any station now then that gives me an indication of there's an opportunity there's something I can mine and 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 you know want to develop further how would you do that so how would you uh, um you know explain how you would do um, you know, you go into a market and there's, uh, you know, there's, I don't know, five or six formats and you want to see if you can, you know, stick in two or three more that are maybe open to you and the size of them. Generally speaking, how would you kind of go about that? Do you, do you give people examples of different formats? That's the most common way to do it. And, and, you know, you know, often on almost every market, I mean, except maybe the very biggest, there is some kind of format that's doing well elsewhere in a similar market. Um, that simply isn't on the air in that market. And there may be two or three of those. You know, it might be mm -hmm. soft AC. It might be, uh, you know, a, a, a 70s and 80s classic hits versus, a, you know, 80s, 90s classic hits. There may be something out there that you know can be successful or you think can be successful, but you want to know whether there is an opportunity in the market that you're in. So you just actually try to come up with a, a, a neutral description of that, what that kind of station does, but then also play a format montage that represents as a good representation of that format. You go into your media base or BDS and you can look at those stations that are successful in that format and you can build a montage of seven or eight songs and, and just little clips of songs. The montage may be a minute long and just ask people, so here's an example of a station um, that, you know, just want to know um, whether this is a station that you would listen to often, once in a while, if you listen to it, would it be your favorite station? Would it be a second choice station? Would it be just another station you listen to? Um, and that gives you a sense of what the appeal is. But then you also ask, and which station, if any, is doing a good job of that now? And if it comes back that nobody's doing a good job and the appeal of that format, and you also oh, want to measure the formats that are already in the market to sort of benchmark against that. And you say, geez, there's an opportunity. Um, and, and I can sort of plug into that. If, if you want to get really fancy, you can use a lot of advanced analytics and build something from scratch without talking about a format that's not in the market, not anywhere that you have an idea there might be a, a, a format there. Um, that's a little trickier. If um, if you're doing the, the brand health thing and, you know, and it's an annual, um, uh, you know, annual checkup of a particular radio station, I would assume talent would be in there somewhere I'm a, amongst a whole bunch of other, you know, different uh, criteria. Skipping morning people for a second, but do jocks usually show up as noticeable and, you know, uh, or are they kind of low on the totem pole? I'll ask you a whole bunch of questions at once. Do they show up? Are they low on the totem pole? Are they <laughs> usually high? You know, what's a good score if a jock would show up versus, you know, the norm where, where they sort of don't show up? And taking all of that into consideration, has it, has it changed from, you know, from when, you know, if you drop back like 20 years and you were looking at scores to now, you know, has it dwindled or gone up or is it the same? 
lot, a lot of question there. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a, there's, and, and, and even some of them, I'm not sure I have an answer for, but I can make a guess um, or, or an estimate because I've never really looked at it quite that way. But, you know, when you're looking to understand how talent's performing in a marketplace, um, the approach that uh, we use, and I think a lot of other research companies use as well, is a variation of what's called the Q-score. Um, mm -hmm. So you're asking about, you know, how do you feel about this person um, and you give them an opportunity to say, I don't know them, but if they know them, you say, you know, are they a favorite? Are they someone that you like? You don't really care. You know, someone you don't like or someone maybe you used to like, but don't like anymore. But for the Q score, that kind of key thing is what's the percentage of people who are familiar with that announcer or that morning show who say it's my favorite or they're a favorite of mine. Because that, those are the people you can, who, if you move them across the street, you have a chance to actually build audience with them. And that means also your competitors can move them across the street and take audience away from you. Um, usually, if you get a Q score of more than 20 for a, for a talent in that market across sort of the broad market, that's a really good score. That's somebody really? who can probably move audiences. And if, if you then look among your own weekly cum and that, or the weekly cum of that, of that, um, that talent, um, you know, if they're above a 30, you know, 30 percent center of familiar say they're a favorite you know that they're probably attract that's probably one of the reasons they're keeping that station is for that talent yeah i, I would that, those talents are very rare like you i, I was get. just going to say that i would assume most jocks think that you know hey how about a 60 or 70 or 80 you know, everybody knows me i'm blah 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 you know but you're right i i in, in my time in you know in the business and all that stuff i think i could count a hand a handful of people that i've encountered that it would be safe to say if i hire them and move them across the street the audience is coming with them you know the other thousand no shot right <laughs> you know, exactly, exactly right i mean if you're in a typical market i would say maybe there's maybe 60 percent of the markets have somebody like that one person like that in the marketplace that can do it mm -hmm. um, but there's you know 40% of the markets, there's nobody who meets that bar. But yeah, it, it is it is rare. Um, and it's almost always morning talent. They have to be kind of showcased. They have, people have to be, again, it's like we're going back to music. They have to be familiar enough with them first to you know make them a favorite. And in the morning, people have that you know special relationship with people they get up with in the morning. And they're you know with them in the car or in the breakfast table or whatever. And it probably has to have a lot of, uh, not a lot, but well, probably a lot, a lot would be great. So some decent amount of advertising to go along with them to 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 try to pump up that familiarity uh, and hold it you know billboards tv you know that kind of stuff uh, you know in addition to them just being on the air uh, because you're going to you're going to hit cume that is uh, you know listeners who do not listen to the radio station and go oh i wonder if i wonder if that team's any good let me see if they're actually yeah. funny you know, that kind of thing. And actually, you mentioned TV. Is I mean, if if they have a TV show in the market, if they're also, you know, that will often help and give them that extra profile. Or yeah. if you advertise that show heavily on the TV over time and you really pos position them well, you can also help that to bump up their score on that as well, right? Yeah. I have this theory, and maybe it's just me, you know, and part of it could be just because I've, you know, I've been, I, I've been doing so much, you know, I spent an, you know, an enormous amount of time in the last two or three years on YouTube trying to understand it and all this, you know, in order to do this course. I have the sense that a regular television and you, a regular television star and a YouTube star or somebody who does something on YouTube and people watch them because they like watching them. I don't know if they delineate a difference between the between those two people. You, you know, it would seem like it would take a radio person, a radio morning show who would do YouTube stuff. And it's funny and it's interesting and maybe even probably longer than they would normally be able to do during the morning show. Um, so they're going deeper. I would think that that would enhance their brand a, a huge amount. Yes? No? Yeah, it can. I mean, I, I think though when you're talking about YouTube, we're talking about podcasts. I think the important thing to understand there, at least from my perspective, we do a lot of work with in podcasts these days and podcasting <laughs> because you know it's certainly um, where the puck seems to be going to a large extent. Um, right. and, you know, just on demand audio content, right? Uh, which is what podcasting is. Um, is that just because uh, I like to say just because podcast rhymes with bot? broadcast it doesn't mean quite the same thing right yeah you know podcasting is i mean uh, you know you it's all about depth of engagement 
Um, it's not about those compromises you make to have a successful mass appeal station in a market. It's like the reverse of that. It's I'm trying to drill into some deep, deep passions that people have. Right. And it might be around a celebrity or around a personality, or it might be around a topic. There's a podcaster that I listen to and like, I, I'm a history freak, um, Dan Carlin, who does a podcast called Hardcore History. Um, mm -hmm. He's actually an old talk show host, uses the medium incredibly well, understands how to use the medium and use his voice effectively. Um, but he also does a lot of really interesting research in terms of the history stuff that he uh, he never, he's an amateur historian, he's not a professional. Because he was asked to compare, what's broadcast, what's podcast, what's the difference? Um, and he said, well, you know, you could be do a podcast about Mexican. I'm, I'm paraphrasing him. I might not have this right. You know, 1950s Mexican science fiction comic books, and you know, somewhere out there, there are people who have been waiting all their lives for some kind of some content about yep. 1950s Mexican sci-fi magazines, and and the world is you, you can get them. All over the world you can find them and if you get them in your podcast you can have an incredibly successful podcast mm -hmm. i mean you could never obviously do that on radio because you're trying to draw a large audience in a specific geographic area so so i think that's kind of the difference so sometimes the two don't connect that well i think if uh, radio talent wants to go and do a podcast they have to think about what is there about them or about what or what they can offer that's unique from what anybody else does and not worry about the people who you know might otherwise tune out right and there's you know, hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there and hundreds of millions probably of youtube shows so how are you going to make your stand out? You're going to deliver something that is unique and is that they can't get somewhere else. There's a huge amount of YouTube stars with like over a million subscribers that are in and around Toronto. One of them is Peter McKinnon. I don't have you ever heard of yeah, Peter no, McKinnon? No, I haven't. Yeah, Peter does. Um, he started out doing, you know, just photography stuff. And then he's moved into video and that type of stuff. And he's really good. And he's, and he's really funny. And he's super engaging. But he stays... He stays in that in somewhat narrow range of photography, video, um, uh, some text stuff and shooting and, and the lifestyle that he's in. And, um, and he, you know, he's gotten so big that uh, I don't know if you remember, but there was a Hyundai car commercial that was out in Christmas with Santa Claus. And he looked like a pretty hip Santa Claus. They actually asked McKinnon to direct it. And he wow. did a. And he did a video cast, you know, YouTube video on him doing that, you know, and it's, you know, he'd look at the camera and like, okay, well, I, I'm a little over my head here. I got 300 guys standing around. I got overheads, I got big cameras. I got, you know, Pana, uh, what, what are they called? Pana, not Panasonic, Pana, Panavision camera. You know, and we're shooting a, a real car commercial, you know, and he's doing it. Uh, and, uh, you know, and he, and he started out in this super little, you know, niche of photography and, right, right. um, and stayed on it for you know for a couple of years and then grown and stuff like that. Which, which you're right, it, that would be totally counterintuitive to a radio show. Yeah, yeah I mean, but he's also sounds like he's very talented as well, right? There's you he's know. extremely. Um, uh, he would be awesome on the radio. Let me put it that way, because he's right. really entertaining and he really has you know he does really different things sometimes, and uh, it, he's interesting. He's an, he's an entertainer. He's an, you know, he is an entertainer. There's no, no doubt about it. Let me move to this because we're in sort of the same realm. You do content testing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, so what is that? I mean, I would assume that you uh, take a podcast or a, or a radio show and, and have people listen to it and pick it apart. Is that kind of roughly it? We work with a partner, uh, Dal Smith out of Portland, um, who have uh, online perceptual analyzer, which is actually a minute by minute Um um, or moment by moment, um, way that they can assess that the listeners can give their opinion of how they feel about what they're listening to at any given point or time. Um, if it's in person, it's a little dial you turn up or you turn down, mm. depending on how you feel. And it actually is used sometimes for music testing as well. Um, but online, um, it's like a little slider that goes across, and you're, you're listening to the piece of content uh, or watching it if it's uh, you know video content, and you move it up when you're feeling good about what you're seeing, you move it down when you're losing interest in it. And, you know, if you get a large enough sample of, of people there, you can start to see a path of, okay, here's something that happened here that made people go up in interest or drop down in interest. And you can, it helps to give you some diagnostics on how 
your content is performing. So what kind of content, um, I mean, we use it for testing morning shows, morning show bits. We might have four or five bits that we have people listen to and, and offer their thoughts on. And sometimes you can see things like, geez, you take too long to get into your bits. They don't, they build mm. interest later, but they're not getting them off the top, right? Um, they're not jumping up off the top. They're taking some time to warm up to get into it. Um, um, or we use it all as well. We use it for testing TV, uh, kids TV shows. We did that kind of testing on it. Um, early this, they had a pilot and, and it came back and says, wow, this was good compared to the other ones that we did. Because we don't only just rely on the moment by moment, but you also ask questions after and get some mm -hmm. sense of what was it that you heard in there that changed things for you? And then asking questions just about the overall appeal of the content. Sometimes you follow it up even with online focus groups so that you can then, then actually peel the onion with those people and understand, okay, so at this particular point, you all kind of thought you went down an interest. What was going on there? And you play it and they go, oh, well, yeah, because he or she did that. Um, so, you know, and we've used it now also for testing podcasts as well. Um, same idea in the sense of as we did for testing kids TV pilots. When you um, when you deliver that, those answers, I'm just really curious. They deliver it to the morning show, you know, your findings about their bits and they, they had to, you should get to it quicker and move in and all that sort of stuff. If you if they've ever told you know, the PD tells you do the morning shows is there okay great I'll do that or is there pushback you know like oh how do you what are you telling me about my morning show I've been doing this forever that kind of thing or I mean do you, do you ever hear that kind of uh, yeah I mean it, actually it, it, I I I guess and again sometimes we're not in the room when the PD is presenting it to the morning show uh, sure but generally it's well received actually it helps to settle arguments a lot of times. Great. And that's one of the things we suggest that, you know, when the, when the programmer um, is where we're picking the bits to test, we sometimes ask the programmer to say, okay, ask the morning show the two bits they think are the best mm. and the two bits they think are the worst or, or, or give you, tell them you pick one that you really like and one you don't like, and they'll pick one they like and one they don't like. And we'll see how that goes because those endless conversations you have air check meetings with, I don't know when you do that. I just, I, and the, and the talent says, no, but that's my thing. That's what I've always done. That's, that's, that, right. you know, and, and, and you can never really settle those arguments, but sometimes something like that can make the difference of going, Oh, okay. I get it. It's good, but it's not working this way. And, and you know, um, it, so it, it can actually kind of provide a little bit of an objective opinion and bring that into the discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would that would be extremely helpful as a PD because God knows we've all been there. No, I, you know, basically I know best. I, you know, I get calls from all my friends and they tell me I'm great. And, uh, you know, and that, that bit was awesome. Meanwhile, everybody else maybe doesn't like it, you know, or, or it's liked it in the beginning. It's gone on too long or. Right, right, exactly. Um, for research, I mean, you've been doing research a long, long time from the beginning. As research, radio research, not regular research, but radio research, other than moving to the net so now it can be done digitally, has, has, has radio research changed very much from, from 20 years ago? Is it sort of the same thing we're getting at, basically, or just a slightly different way of actually getting at the numbers? For the most part, it's pretty much the same for the last 50 years or so. I mean, perceptual studies started about 50 years ago doing, yeah. the, you know, doing call out when it goes back, you know, 50 years ago, as you say, a lot of that's moved from being telephone calls or in person to being online now for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, but even then, we still sometimes do auditory music tests where the programmer can see his audience and see them doing, you know, putting out the checks in terms of how they feel about the songs. Um, the basics are still there. Um, I mean, What's changed probably more than anything else is that stations don't have as much budget for it as they used to. Yeah. Um, and that's part of what's moved it online because it is, you know, more cost effective to move it online for sure. I think the one thing that, um, and, and we're really just scratching the surface on it now is, you know, perceptual research depends on what, you know, and it's all about trying to understand what's in your listeners' heads. You know, what station do you think of first for this? What station do you go to first for that? What, um, you know, it, because you really you never get to see your listeners. So it gives you a sense of what they're thinking about and what the images that you need to kind of develop. Um, but, you know, the extent to which that connects to actual behavior is sometimes a little fuzzy because behavior is different than 
um, perceptions. Um, you know, people may have perceptions, but does, you know, some of those perceptions may connect to behavior, some don't. Um, with PPM, and it's got a lot of issues, a lot of problems, but do you aggregate PPM over a long enough period of time to get rid of all those sample wobbles and everything else? You can get an understanding of what sort of does seem to be working. It's, it's purely about behavior, about exposure um, of, of what you know, uh, people will listen to and keep listening to. So you can look at, we've done this for, um, um, for example, you know, doing this for news stations um, that have are on a clock. And you can take not just one hour, but you can take thousands of hours over a year and understand how, what's, where are the weak points in that clock? Um, looking at PPM observations over that, you, you know, PPM can bounce around because there's so few meters, but when you're looking at something yeah. like that, you start to get, you can see patterns that are, that are real there. So that, you know, that's one thing. And with streaming, the streaming of your AM FM station, if you're able to look at it um, and, and get that again, um, aggregated over time, you can see things where, there's spikes in your programming that people are tuning in for. Um, one thing about streaming is it's a very conscious kind of activity. People going to their phones to actually go to listen to that at that time. So you see really active tune-in points that you wouldn't even see in PPM or you certainly wouldn't necessarily get out of uh, perceptual study. But, you know, sports stations on on draft day, you, they spike like crazy for um, uh, on streaming because people are, you know, actively going to Who's find drafted, those stations. Yeah. You know, they, they're not near a regular radio. They're, they have to find that. Um, Christmas stations that are playing Christmas music will get spikes in streaming. Um, stations that, um, uh, you know, a, a new station station on a, on a really, you know, cold or weird weather day will get those same kind of spikes that you don't even see in PPM or anything else, but you do see them there. But sometimes too, you can see a morning show feature that you can see a spike there that people are actually going and, 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 and getting some active tune in that. So I think that's probably as, as we get into more and more of that type of data, big data, if you like, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, People like me who, you know, are, do surveys will probably move over and data scientists will move in um, to help take that data and, and research and learning for uh, programmers and, and, and radio um, uh, to kind of a whole different place than where it you know, started, like I say, 50 years ago and really stayed fundamentally yeah. the same. Yeah, that's encouraging because, I mean, uh, I mean, just saying it when you go, gee, research hasn't, you know, what what the questions that, uh, you know, you're we're asking about radio and what you're kind of wanting to find out, if it, it hasn't changed much in 50 years. You'd kind of think, you know, maybe 20 years and there's kind of a change, a major change. You know what I mean? That, that seems radio, like a well, radio has changed a lot in 50 years, but the way it's research hasn't changed that, that dramatically. No, I know. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, just like radio programming itself really hasn't you know, changed a whole lot since when Bill Drake put on the Drake stations, really, you know, in 80, 90% of what he did then, that's what you hear on the regular radio stations. You, you know, you, you'd kind of, you know, either he got it perfectly right or you'd think that it would move, uh, you know, a little bit, but it's, but for sure, it's starting to move now more and more and more because, well, for, you know, financial reasons, you kind of have to start, you know, changing, changing things up and doing things differently, you know, voice tracking and all that, all that other yeah. stuff. It's like, it's a, Definitely a different physical ball game, which makes it a different hearing ball game right, um, right. out there. Yeah. yeah, no, I think you're right, Pat. I mean, it, you know, radio has traditionally been a very insular industry. Radio right. people are radio people. That's kind of, you know, that's the way it has been for 50 years. But um, maybe, you know, one of the best parts about consolidation um, and you do start to see, you know, see this particularly in Canada, but I think you see it um, in the UK and Australia as well, maybe not so much in the US. Um, but you see broadcast divisions breaking down the walls between the radio and the TV side. Mm -hmm. breaking the walls between the radio and the TV and the digital side. And suddenly you're getting a whole bunch of new people in there thinking about radio and thinking about content and how they can use that on different platforms. And, and I think that does inject actually kind of some new ideas into the, in, into the mix. Um, I mean, it's done for cost reasons and for synergies um, and, 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 and to understand how they can make the best use of resources they have. But I think also, you know, part of that best use is that you, you do get some fresh blood in there, you know, yeah. uh, the you know, British, British broadcast broadcast groups seems to me have been doing that for, well, but, you know, even before I retired, I mean, you know, they, you know, you'd look and you go like, wow, they're, they're net stuff, their websites of what they do and what, the, you know, and that type of thing, or like 
way ahead of North America. Yeah. I, you know, it just seems like, you know, it almost seems like, I, and I think a couple of companies are there. There's, they were sort of like internet companies first that got radio stations as opposed to radio stations that are trying to toy with the net. You know, it's almost like Google bought Cumulus or, you know, right, or, or right. iHeart or something like yeah. that. You know, yeah. they, they come in with a different thinking and, well, here, why don't we just do all of this? That, that's my impression of, you know, the British stations and their networks, you know, across mm -hmm. the country. A uh, smaller country makes it easier, but they tend to be, you know, pretty cool. Um, you, you know, we're, what are we here? We're, ooh, we're coming up on an hour. Wow. I don't think I've ever done one of these uh, an hour. It's long, but it, you know, it's funny. We could probably do two or three hours of this thing because uh, there's so many areas to cover. I'm sure along the way, you know, have to deal with new PDs or PDs who maybe are having research, maybe they've been a PD a long time and they're catching research for the very first time. And, and, uh, you know, they're, they're a newbie at research, not maybe necessarily at being a PD, you know, are there any things that stick out to you that like mistakes that they make or you sort of wish that they knew this? It would be great for somebody watching this to actually know. So you're talking about in terms of research or just in just in yeah, general? no, in research, yeah, research, yeah, 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 research in, in terms of research. Well, or, yeah, or, I, I, you know. I think probably um, the most important thing that I could pass on is. And, and, and it's, it's a natural thing. And it's actually particularly for radio people, very kind of independent people who've, you know, who've got where they are through their um, own smarts. They wouldn't necessarily, you know, they didn't take, a, you know, um, psychology degree or anything like that. They just have an intuitive sense of what's right or, and, and, and often are very, very right. Challenge sometimes is that they will want to do a study and they will, say, here's the questions I want to ask in the study. Right. Instead of here's what I need to know. What the researcher needs is tell me what you need to know and I'll develop something that will help you get those answers. But if you try to ask listeners what they want, problem is they don't really know. Um, if you just say, so would you like, what would you like, what would, what would be the kind of radio station you would like to hear? I mean, radio, listeners will give you an answer Right. But it's not very meaningful. Steve Jobs, you know, I mean, famously has said he never did consumer research because, and that's actually, he's exactly right. For that very reason, you can't, you couldn't, he couldn't have asked people, so what kind of a smartphone would you like when there was no smartphones? He had to, but he did yeah. it a different way. He, you know, he still did research in the sense of observing people's behavior and how they interacted with um, technology and then understanding that and then built through design, built these different tools and, and things from that, from that, those insights. Um, but he was still doing research, but he wasn't asking them, so what do you want on an iPhone? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't ask listeners. So what do you want? So, you know, what, what should, you know, the research should be simple. Just ask them what, what do we do? That's great. What do we do? That's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you have to, again, you have to kind of get at it a different way. Right. Um, and that's probably the biggest thing from research standpoint and, and, you know, normally kind of walk new PDs or, or, or people who sort of new to research through that the first couple of times and they kind of get that and understand that. And they can, that's, the job of the researcher to build trust too that the questions they're going to ask are the ones that are going to get the answers that they need. But the real focus there is it's like, you know, again, going back to grade 11 science experiment, you start with a hypothesis and then you test it, you know, you, you build the research to test whether it, the hypothesis is true or not. So tell me what you think you, you would, would work in this market and let's build something to see how that would work. Looking at all of the factors, how do people use the, the medium now in your market, what stations get credit for doing those kinds of things, where might the opportunity lie? That's different. And then I can tell you whether that hypothesis holds water or maybe here's something else you should consider as well. You know, one of the things that um, uh, always used to go through my mind uh, in doing research with you, you know, or, or anybody um, was to try to make sure that when I got an answer back, I knew what to do with it. Right. You, you know what I mean? That 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 if you if you were asking about music things, uh, like even to go back to the montages, that I was really clear in my mind what each of those montages were. Um, so you know, in other words, if you were making them and you go, "Hey, what about this?" I, the two of us might end up shaping them so that I was super comfortable with if that comes back as you know, montage C is the big one. I know exactly what they're talking about from a field point of view, 
you know, I know what that means. That means, you know, classic hit station. That means a top 40. That means an urban leaning top 40. That means whatever that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You you know, um, because sometimes I've seen, um, you know, in, in sometimes in different markets where, you know, when I was a national PD, you'd go in and you look at the research and go, I, I, I don't know what you'd do with this answer. Well, you know, I'm not quite sure how you'd, you know, how you'd adjust with this, yeah. uh, you, you know, so I, you know, I would assume that, you know, something like that would, would be in the mix there also. Yeah, yeah no, that's great. I mean, in fact, you know, that's, you know, a really important part of the research process uh, and what the researcher needs to get from the programmer or whoever they're working with in the research is, again, what are the things that you need to find out? Um, what are the hypotheses you have about what's working or what's not or what what needs to be done? And so we can build the survey to do that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, when I give you that questionnaire, I want to know that no matter what, whatever those numbers that come back for that question are, that you're going to have an understanding of what that means and what to do with that information. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm just giving you a bunch of data, right? And yeah. and 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 you have to know, you have to feel that uh, the programmer um, has the confidence that okay, the answer to that question. And again, sometimes the researcher may explain the context for that question, and and there may be some other analytics that are attached to it, but that that end result is going to be something that's going to make a difference in terms of the decisions that the programmer has to make. Otherwise, it is just a bunch of numbers. Yeah, yeah, and then then what do you do with it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's been great, Jeff. Uh, We've done an hour, which is uh, remarkable (laughs) to me, because I've I've always tried to keep these things around 30 minutes, because, you know, because people get bored, you know, uh, but this is, you know, I don't, I, I noticed uh, kind of like a podcast of, uh, you know, I've watched Joe Rogan things go like two and a half hours and I'm there the whole time <laughs> because it's interesting the whole time. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, hopefully this will be the same and uh, we'll probably get to kick in and, you know, and do this again somewhere down the road for some other things. Cause it's neat to, uh, to talk research, but then it's neat to sort of marry that, you know, uh, for what I know and what you know, to actually programming a radio station, yeah. which again is what you know the, what the course is all about. Yeah. So I thank you, sir. It's been great well, catching you. up. Great yeah. seeing you. You look really, uh, really good, really healthy. Everything's good. Everything is great. Thank you so much, and and just great to catch up with you too, Pat. I mean, uh, you know, as you said, you and I could probably sit around and chat for hours. I don't know if anybody oh really want to listen to us for hours, but you know, um, hopefully, <laughs> um, the you know hour or so that we've chatted is uh, is going to be helpful to those who um, have had a chance would. to watch the yeah i think it'd be very helpful to people yeah. uh and, you know, you know and congratulations time. by the way for doing this i think this is a wonderful thing to be able to offer uh programmers i don't think there's ever been anything quite like this there's never really been that master class of pro on programming um and it's again one of the things that youtube makes possible that you know it wouldn't have been possible you know 20 years ago or 30 years ago you and i both work for the same person i would bring it up a lot um, and, um, you know, Hey, why don't we have a, why don't we have a feeder station kind of like what used to be done in, you know, 50, 60 years ago, mm-hmm. like in the RKO general chain, sure. Memphis, Memphis was a feeder station. So they had better PDs than normal. They had better jocks than normal. And when, so it was a farm team, it was, that right. was the farm right. club. Yeah. If you wanted to jockey and go look and you just went to Memphis and grab somebody that you'd <laughs> grab, that's where Rick D's came from. They grabbed right. Rick D's out of there and a whole bunch of other people, um, um, because they were already trained to do the format. And it's like, well, we should do that somewhere else. It becomes difficult, even if you have a big chain, let's say you have a chain of 50 stations coast to coast, do you bring 50 PDs in? Because you can't really teach somebody to be a programmer in, in a weekend. You just can't do it. It's right. impossible, really. Yeah. You know, so you know, you're not going to have them there for months. Does the person go around to each market and you know, there's one or two people in each market, 50, 50 you can't. So th- this is really sort of turned out to be the only logical way to, you know, go down this road. So, so I'm going down the wonderful. Down the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. It's, yeah, yeah. it's terrific. It really yeah, is. Thank you. And fun to chat. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. All right. Till the next time, Jeff. Thank you very you much. Bet. Hope you're enjoying the lessons. If you want to keep up to date, subscribe, make sure that you hit that notification button so you get notified when there's new lessons. And the like button is also pretty cool too. If you hit the like thing, that actually helps the channel with the YouTube algorithms. All right, so glad you're here. Hope you're getting something out of it. Hope you're enjoying it. Until the next lesson, see ya.